Hey guys, welcome to day eight. Our video lecture series today uh, is going to wrap up the 1960s, and we're going to be talking about the 1960s in the counterculture. Um, so something I know a few of you uh, in class talked about on that first day of school uh, as something you guys were looking forward to learning about, and it's important that we learn about the counterculture because they're going to play such a huge role um, in the Vietnam War. Uh, not so much in the fighting of the war, but in the protesting and the way Americans feel at home about what's happening in Vietnam. Um, so we're going to dive into the counterculture, what they believe in, what they stood for, um, some of the things that they were doing, um, some of the things socially that they were doing that was new and different, um, and then seeing this youth versus adult movement, um, because you're going to see drastic differences in society, um, the youth versus the adults in the way that they think. Now, when we're talking about the counterculture, and we're talking about the youth really being the ones that adapt into the counterculture, please don't think that every single youth was part of this. Um, the counterculture was more of a minority movement that started to gain power um, and got more people involved, but it wasn't like 90% of American uh, teenagers or youth were part of the counterculture. Heck, not even 50% of American youth um, were part of the counterculture movement. But it does have a huge voice, and it has a voice that we have to know and we have to listen to because it's going to carry over through not only the 1960s, but in the 1970s as well. Even into the 1980s and some of the stuff that happens, you know, um, with disco and things like that, that's part of the counterculture. It's, it's just the counterculture growing up and then their kids adopting some of the values and beliefs that their parents had, all right? Um, so without further ado, get out your notes and open up to the counterculture and let's get going, all right? So the counterculture, uh, they had songs about racial inju injustice, nuclear war, and other serious issues that engage people living in the time of this social change that's happening in the 1960s. One of the major artists that was known for creating this music uh, was a guy named Bob Dylan. Some of you may have heard of Bob Dylan, some of his works. Now, when you, when you listen to Bob Dylan's music, um, it's more like poetry. He's speaking. It's not like songs that you would hear on the radio today. Um, and a lot of the counterculture music is like this. They're telling stories with it. Um, and so, you know, the music of the Vietnam era that we'll get into during the Vietnam War of, like, Fortunate Son and things like that um, are stories that are being told. And they're not like lyrical as in the music you're listening to today, all right? Uh, Jimi Hendrix was part of this movement as well. So the lyrics uh, held more in common with beat poetry than with simple rhymes or teenage love songs. So you got to think like the early 60s, you have people like the Beatles and the European invasion in the United States. And they're singing these heartthrob songs that people are going crazy to. And before that, you know, Elvis Presley um, and his heartthrob songs that were more like love songs and feel-good, uplifting songs, cheery songs. That's not what the counterculture is trying to do. And so for a lot of people, they're, they're listening to the music of the counterculture and they're like, well, this isn't like the popular stuff we're hearing on the radio. This is stuff talking about issues. It's not like catchy tunes that you find yourself like humming to yourself. Um, these are more inspirational and, and people are listening to it and they're starting to question society and what they're being told because of what they're hearing in the music. They concluded that society had to change. People experimented with new ways of living. Um, they redefined old ideals such as freedom and democracy um, in their own terms in a group with new ideas and behaviors which were very different from those of the mainstream culture. That's really what defines the counterculture. So here's mainstream America, all right? And the counterculture is all the way over here. And so their views are not in line with mainstream. They're off to the side. Their views are completely separate. You know, the way they look at domestic issues, the way they look at foreign issues, the way they look at wars. All right, the way they look at family structure and social life are going to be different than mainstream America. Mainstream America says this is how it's been, this is how it's always going to be. All right, you know, the husband goes to work, the mother stays home, takes care of the family, and, and then here you have the counterculture that says, why is that? Why is it that the woman has to stay home? Why can't women have more rights? Why can't women 
be the one in charge. And so you're just seeing a lot of times this counterculture and mainstream start running into each other. And then that's when conflict starts. And not conflict that's going to be violent because the counterculture is, you know, that peace, love, and happiness, make love, not war. But it's going to be protests and march, marches where they're going to confront the mainstream and say, why do it this way? Why not conform? Or, you know, not all the way to what the counterculture wants, but we have to be able to meet somewhere in the middle. And somewhere it's not mainstream and somewhere it's way not out to the right or left, okay? So, activists on college campuses. Um, small groups of student activists formed a movement um, that called on students to reject the social norms. Um, students who made up the new left rejected the, uh, you know, the common teachings and the things that they had done before. Sorry, real quick, my, my computer's not working real well right now. There it is. It's working great. Um, they were committed to more traditional American ideals, such as the democratic goal of allowing all people to take an active part in the government. The government's not just for the rich, all right? Everyone should have a role. And it's not just for men. Women should have a role. Minorities should have a role. Um, and so it's, it's trying to open the government up to everyone, all right? The strongest voice in the new left was a group called the Students for a Democratic Society. These are going to be the groups that really start rising up on college campuses when you start seeing a lot of the protests with. Um, a student protest at the University of California, Berkeley, radicalized a large number of students across the country and really started this free speech movement in the United States where these students on college campuses said, you know, you can't censor us and you can't stop us. We can gather and we can hold rallies and we can have marches because we have free speech. And the free speech movement starts to spread like wildfire. So other students at other college campuses start saying the same thing. They're like, well, you can't restrict us because of our right of free speech. Some protests re uh, revolved around local issues. Others were reactions to the growing U.S. military presence in Vietnam. So these local issues start to go away. And most of these protests start to really be centered around Vietnam post-1965. So in 66, 67, 68, when the war in Vietnam is starting to intensify and we're starting to draft more Americans, more 18, 19, 20-year-olds, the local issues aren't that important anymore. Now it is fighting what's happening in the war in Vietnam. I do not know what's happening here. Boom. More trouble, of course. The PowerPoint. It's not working right. It's all right. Um, an emerging counterculture rejects the establishment. Another form of rebellion against social experiment uh, ex exceptions. Many young people dropped out of school. Um, they rejected the rat race or these nine to five jobs. And so you see these young people saying, why go to school? Why be you know, sucked into corporate America, sitting in a cubicle, sitting in an office, working nine to five? I, I want to live my own life. I want my own freedoms, okay? These people are known as hippies. They developed a counterculture seeking freedom of expression. Um, hippies dressed in jeans, colorful tie-dye t-shirts. They wore sandals. Um, and they wore necklaces, these big, long necklaces uh, that were known as uh, love beads, all right, that they had around. Um, and they would hold the peace symbol on them. Um, they wore their hair long and gave up shaving or wore makeup um, because those are things that mainstream America did. The mainstream America, people got their hair cut. Um, they looked formal, women wore makeup, um, you know, they're clean shaven, Th their appearance was up to whatever their specific job was, you know, was nice. This is also going against the military values, you know, military values, people's heads are shaved, clean cut, clean shaven, um, and the hippies are going to say, well, we're not like that, we're rejecting that, we're, we're the complete opposite of this. Um, many lived on handouts from their parents. Um, many live by begging or by taking short-term jobs and then traveling around the United States looking for work. Uh, one belief that unified them was the distrust in the establishment. The establishment obviously being who? You know, the government, right? So they distrust the government. They're not going to put their money in banks. They don't believe that the government is really benefiting them. They see the government as being more of a hindrance to them, uh, prohibiting them from doing things that they want to do. And so they are going to fight against 
that establishment. Um, and really, when the war starts, the establishment is seen as the major evil because it's sending people off to die in foreign lands to fight this war. So, continuing, uh, a, gener a generation gap opens between the rebel youth and mainstream parents. The youth let their hair grow long, wore hippie clothes, and, and criticized the establishment as we talked about, especially the Vietnam War. The result was a growing generation gap. You know, you have your parents, and then you have your children. And they used to be really close. You know, the parents would give their values to the children, and they pretty much lived the same way. And then once they got older, those children became just like their parents, and then their kids would be just like them. Well, here's the problem. The parents are living their life. The youth or counterculture is living their life. They are never going to conform to be like their parents. They're going to stay over here. And the parents are going to continually get further away, and you have this separation or this gap in generations. They have major differences in attitudes and behaviors. Adults who have lived through the Depression and World War II often dismiss the long-haired hippies as spoiled rich kids. They're saying they don't understand what life's really like, what hardships are like for people. They didn't experience all this. They didn't have to go fight and serve for their country because they're not afraid of their country being taken over. We did all this for them. Now they get to go out there and freely express themselves and not have to worry about some sort of dictator or oppressor coming and taking over their country because we handled all that for them. All right? The majority of young people, however, did adhere to the mainstream values. Um, like their parents, they wanted a good education, a decent job, a successful marriage, and their own home. So like we talked about, it's not a majority of people that are here. This is the minority that are the counterculture. A majority of people that are in the youth are going to follow their parents' direction, are going to want that because they look at their parents. Well, they're financially successful. They got a good education. They have a good house. They have a good marriage. Um, and they're going to say, well, this is what I want. You know, they don't have this oppression. And so where do we see the counterculture really jumping up? College campuses, all right, and big cities. If you live in rural America, are you going to be part of the counterculture? Absolutely not. You're going to adhere to those values. Um, so, you know, if you're living in Delaware, Ohio, is it a big counterculture movement? Probably not, unless you're going to Ohio Wesleyan, which is a college. And you're going to see some, but not a ton. If you are out in California, you're going to see more, right? And especially if you're on some of those college campuses like Berkeley, UCLA, um, USC, you're going to see a larger movement. Why is that? You have more minorities that are joining the counterculture movement because they're fighting against the oppressed. Well, who's the major oppressed group in the United States? Minorities, women, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, all right? Um, and then you start to have white males join that group, and then it's going to start growing, all right? But the counterculture is never going to get over the majority. It's always going to stay in the minority. So don't get confused and think that during this time period, it's going to like overtake the United States and, and what everyone believes in. That's not going to happen. But their voice is going to be heard, and it is going to influence the majority in the decisions that they make. Because... As a decision maker, you have to appease everyone, right? Or you got to at least try. So if you have this group that keeps protesting and keeps civil unrest, somehow you need to make it so that they start conforming or at least believe in what you're saying to help them out. Um, that's it for part one. We'll get back with part two here in a second, so stay tuned. Um, take a break, get something to drink, and then we'll be right back into the counterculture. <laughs> 